Lord willing, we are going to resume our regular services. 8.30, excuse me, 9.30 will be our Bible class. Brother Aaron will be teaching that. 10.30 will be our morning worship. We'll see how it goes, whether we keep on resuming night services or not But uh, for a while. But we're excited that we're going to be able to do this. Uh, we have contacted most, most of our people, and we have got a positive response. Uh, I, I, I'm grateful for that. Most of our people want to resume services and be back in God's house. Uh, someone asked the question the other day, well, <clears throat> are you legal? Or are, you, are you going against the uh, uh, direction of, of the governor? No. If you know what our governor said on his restrictions, he, he did not restrict the churches from ever meeting. He never did. He, he laid out some guidelines and said, we'd like for you to follow these guidelines. But he did, when closing down the state, he did not close down the churches. We closed down because of the love for our people and the concern for our people that we certainly do not want anyone to, to have this. We do not want anyone to contact this. It is real. I've always said that and, and that. But we closed down out of love and concern for our people. And we're still going to be careful. We're going to follow the guidelines, the distancing uh, guidelines, the uh, no uh, shaking hands, no hugging for at least for a while. I put that in there because I uh, sooner or later we'll get back to what we're doing as a Baptist church. <laughs> but uh, we will follow the guidelines. You can wear, you can wear a mask if you wish to do so. That's up to you. And then we want to make it very clear to, to those who are listening in. If you do not feel comfortable, you're not uh, free about coming, please stay home. We'd like to have you, but if you're not comfortable right now, we're not going to uh, be on anybody's case. We're not going to be down on anybody. We want you to feel comfortable when you come back. So please, please, you, you pray about it. You use your discretion and you do what God wants you to do. But for those who feel comfortable and would like to get back worshiping God in God's house, we look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 930. So we hope you're here. Uh, also be much in prayer. I believe Cindy Weaver and the family are uh, flying back down to Florida tomorrow. Uh, I'm not 100%, but that was the word I have. And we want to continue to pray for them. I want to continue to urge the church, if you will, please, please encourage Cindy. Don't take much but a little bit out of your time to get a card and send her a card. It'd be really encouraging to her. We need to keep praying, praying for our country, praying for our president, praying for those who are in places of leadership, uh, praying uh, that this thing will begin to wind down and we can get back to a normal way of life. Amen. And, you know, they keep saying, well, we're not going to get back to normal. Well, I got news for them. I'm going to get back to normal. Amen. So anyway, be praying about that. Now, just before Brother Aaron comes, uh, Barbara Pennington, one of our dear ladies, sent this. May, it may have sent it to some of you. Uh, we've been, I've been talking about it. We've got to get past this fear factor, folks, and especially this fear of being around people. Amen. We cannot live like that very long. Uh, our society is built on interaction between people. And this, fee this is a thing I am so disturbed about this, is the fear that they put in people about it. I, I believe it's real. I will, I'm not going to take chances with it. 
I'm going to do everything I can if I know somebody's got it to stay away from them. But we have got to overcome this fear factor to get back to normal. She sent this. And I thought it'd be interesting to share with you tonight before Brother Aaron comes. It's called Addressing Our Fear-Based Agendas. In 2000, YK is going to kill us all. 2001, anthrax is going to kill us all. 2002, the West Nile virus is going to kill us all. 2003, SARS is going to kill us all. 2005, the bird flu is going to kill us all. 2006, E. coli is going to kill us all. 2008, the bad economy is going to kill us all. 2009, swine flu is going to kill us all. 2010, BP oil is going to kill us all. You remember they spilt some out there in the Gulf and everybody said that's the end of it uh, there. In 2013, North Korea is going to kill us all. 2014, the Ebola virus is going to kill us all. In 2016, Z Zakia virus is going to kill us all. Some of these, I just lived through it. I didn't even know they were going on. <laughs> I, I mean, I had no idea. Uh, I just lived through it, I guess. And now in 2020, the coronavirus is going to kill us all. But really, fear is killing us. So what? Turn off that TV. Amen. Amen. I thought that was pretty good. Come on, Brother Aaron, and bless us tonight with God's Word. Amen. Unless you're watching me on your television, then don't turn it off. <laughs> There's a lot to be said about uh, always having some thing that's going to take us down. Um, if you're saved, there's nothing that's going to kill you. Amen. Your body may die, but your soul and spirit will live forever. And then one day uh, we'll have our glorified new body. And so we already, we've already we already got the victory. Um, I was asked a question, so I'm switching gears tonight. I was going to go into the set, continue on my, my study with the seven heads of the Antichrist. Um, but tonight I just want to switch gears because I've had... A few people ask the question, <clears throat> and I'll bring the question up later, what was asked of me. But um, the title of my lesson tonight is To Save a Nation. To Save a Nation. There's um, something I brought up um, in one of my last lessons or sermons, and, and we're going to start there, and we're going to pick up and expound on this just a little bit. But turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter number 51 in your Bible. Jeremiah 51. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about how to save a nation or a kingdom. Because I believe as Christians and God's people, it's in our hands whether or not America stands or falls. And as the Christian goes, so goes the world. So goes the world. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse number 25, if you've been uh, tuning into the lessons that I've done the last two, um, <clears throat> this is going to be somewhat familiar to you. Verse number 25, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth, and I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks, and I will make thee a burnt mountain. Now, the point I brought up before, and I'm going to go a little bit more into it again in case you didn't catch the other lessons. Um, a mountain here is referenced as a kingdom. And at this point in history, Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is talking about Babylon. At this point. Now, that being said, go to Daniel chapter number two. Turn right in your Bible. Daniel chapter number two. 
Daniel 2, because I want to back this up. Because there's two types of mountains or kingdoms. And I'm going to read the other mountain or kingdom now. In Daniel chapter number 2, verse number 35, the Bible reads, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became, and became like the chafe of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. There's a great mountain that's going to cover the entire earth. And I think I, I, I explained it like this, that it's not a mountain that is going to engulf the earth as a physical mountain, but this is a kingdom. How do you know? Verse number 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God had made, God had made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words tonight, not mine, that it would be your Holy Spirit that moves, Lord, and that it would touch and strengthen our people and those that are listening uh, as guests tonight, Lord. I just ask that you be with Cindy Weaver, Milo's wife, as they return to Florida, Lord. Be with them, strengthen them. Lord, I, I can think as we pray of so many people that we've lost over the past few years. And Lord, I just, I, I know they're, they're looking down on that great cloud of witnesses and they're looking down at us and they're seeing us continuing to, to fight and struggle and try to persevere and they're rooting us on. Lord, I just ask that you would just be with us, strengthen us and encourage us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So what we see here is that a mountain is a kingdom and there are two types of kingdoms. One is the kingdom of men, and the other is the kingdom of God, or Jesus, his kingdom, since Jesus is God. Now, tonight I'm going to slow down just a little bit because what I want to talk tonight is how to retake our kingdom or save our nation, how to save the mountain that's the United States. And if you don't live in America tonight and you're watching us online, you can save your nation too, brother and sister in Christ. You can do great things through God to save your kingdom. But you know what? It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of dedication. And I'll tell you right now, Christians in the last decade or two have really shunned from the word work when it comes to the house of God. So let's just be honest with ourselves. It is going to take work. You can't be a fly by the seat of your pants Christian and expect to save this nation. You can't. It's going to cost you something. You know, when I, I just thinking about things in the Old Testament, King David would not accept a field, a gift in, in, or a threshing floor. He actually, when, when they were going to give it to him, uh, he said, no, I'm going to pay for it because it's important that I do that. See, things are going to cost you something and saving America tonight is going to cost us Christians a few things. It may cost you um, some friends. It may cost you some money. It may cost you and it should cost you a lot more of your time. You're going to see that tonight. But I want to talk about how to save the United States, our mountain our kingdom right now, this kingdom of men. See, there's coming a kingdom that Jesus is going to reign over, and that's going to be during the millennial reign of Christ, his millennial reign. But I truly believe as Christians, we can postpone 
the end. I believe that because when we look at the seven kingdoms, there was a timeline in which each kingdom took place all the way up to the Roman Empire. And then there's a break in action for several thousand years so far where there's not been another world empire. There's coming a seventh world empire, a seventh Babylon, but we as Christians can push that B system back because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Look, God God knows when it's going to take place. But we as Christians, we need to just occupy till we come and we need to stem the tide of wickedness and all the things that are destroying our nation. I truly believe, as I started studying this, that there are many times in the Bible where the Christian was able to hold God's hand of judgment back. And that's what I want to accomplish tonight. I want us to get serious about being Christians tonight. I want us to get serious about saving our nation tonight. You know, we're going to save our nation if, if we do what we're supposed to do. But first off, we need to realize that we actually possess the kingdom right now. What do you mean? Turn to Luke chapter number 17, Luke 17. Luke 17. Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> Verses 20 and 21. Luke 17, 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, this is Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And listen to me tonight. If you are saved, you have the kingdom of God residing in you. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. You are the kingdom of God. This is our this is our country to take back. We have allowed wicked politics and wicked agendas to destroy our nation. We need to stand up and be heard tonight. But before we stand up, there's a few things we need to do. And I thought it was really ironic. Of course, I don't believe there's no irony in the Bible. But verses number 22 through verses number 37 of the same chapter, this speaks of the time when Christ will return. This speaks of that time when Christ will return and judge the world. Um, but starting in chapter 18, which I found to be really interesting as well. Verse number one, because see, if you believe the kingdom of God is in you, then you believe you have the Holy Spirit of God residing in you. And there's nothing you can't do without the Holy Spirit helping you. There's nothing. Everyone is capable of doing these things. Verse number one, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continuing continual coming she weary me. What's that mean? Well, we have the clue in verse number one. Pray and faint not. Don't faint. Keep praying. If you want to save our nation, if you want to save our kingdom, if you want something to hand down to your children and your grandchildren, then we need to pray to God until we get a hold of God. Amen. And you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And you can go and petition to, to Jesus and you can ask him, Lord, if it's your will, change things. Verse number six, and the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge the, his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Look, God doesn't always answer our prayer right away. See, it's going to take a lot of work for us to take back America. It's going to take a lot of praying to take back America. You can't just pray over your dinner to take back America. It's going to take a little more work than that to take this nation back. You can't just sit at the end of your bed and say, now I lay me down to sleep. Oh, Lord, take back America for me. No, you've got to get a hold of God tonight. 
You got to get a hold of him with everything you have. You got to weary God tonight. You got to say, God, I'm not willing to give up America tonight. I'm not willing to let the devil take my family tonight. You got to get a hold of God tonight. I tell you that he will avenge, the, avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on earth? You know what? Is God going to find faith when he comes? Oh, you may be saved tonight when the Lord comes to take you out of here. What's your faith going to look like when he gets you? What's your faith going to look like? Are you going to have faith? Are you going to have the kind of saving faith? Are you going to have the kind of faith that you can move mountains? kind of faith are you going to have when he comes? You know what? I believe Jesus is writing this because his example is, is, is he's, he's talking to his disciples and he's saying, you know, we're going to go into the garden of Gethsemane here in a little bit. And not one of you is going to stay up with me and pray. Not a one of you. And unfortunately, that example rings true in America tonight because I can tell you right now, when's the last time any of you lost sleep over praying for that person you love? And if you have, that's great. Keep on doing it. Be relentless. Don't give up. Let's take it back. Take your family back from the devil. Take your nation back from the devil. Verse number nine, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. That's real interesting. See, you know, there's always a bunch of do-gooders that think they're better than everybody else, right? There's always a bunch of people, oh, I, I pray all the time, I do all this. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you. If I had a dollar for every time someone said they prayed for me, I'd probably have a million dollars. Why? Because it's easy to just roll things off your tongue, but are you doing it? And are you really praying for someone? Are you really getting down on your knees? Are you really finding a place at, or a time when you're walking through your house and you realize that that person's face has come into your mind and you stop everything you're doing and you get down on your knees or you shed a tear or you get out your Bible and read a verse and claim that person? When have you done that? Christian, because I can tell you right now, many Christians are failing at it tonight because if we were doing it, America wouldn't look the way it looks tonight. But no, America's falling apart. Why? Because when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Is there any that'll stay up with Jesus and pray? Oh, I'm tired. I had a hard day. I have a lot of hard, hot, long days, but I got to make time to pray. And if I forget, which I'm human, I remind myself and I try to pray twice as much the next day if I can. Pray always. Pray without ceasing. Talk to God all day long. He just wants to hear from you. Talk to him about the trouble you're having. Talk to him about the fears that are going through your mind. Talk to him. He's there. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with, with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humbleth himself. You know, it takes a lot for a human being to humble themselves. Why? Because we have pride. When's the last time you humbled yourself? put someone first, humbled yourself, went out of your way to avoid things, humbled yourself, put things out of your life that didn't need to be there, humbled yourself, 
took some reproof, some correction, and changed some things. See, what Jesus is saying is, hey, these guys did all the work. They fasted twice a week. They, they fasted. Lord, didn't you say to fast and pray? Lord, throughout your word, isn't fasting important? Isn't this something that we need to get a hold of? And Jesus is saying, yeah, but you're not doing it humbly. You're not coming to me. You're not fasting in your heart. You're doing it on the outside, but you're not doing it on the inside. And that's the problem that many Christians have tonight. They, they don't fast on the inside. They fast on the outside. So one of the challenges I want to give you tonight, Christian, because honestly, there's, there's probably not a lot of people who aren't saved tuning in tonight. There probably aren't a lot of unsaved people that even watch our sermons, although I hope they do, and I hope they get saved. I hope they find that saving faith. But this is a call tonight to you, Christian. Let us move a mountain together. Let us move this nation to where it needs to be. Let us move this kingdom of men before the kingdom of our Lord comes in. You know, I truly believe, and I'm going to give some examples tonight through the Bible, where God gives us a direct order on how to save our nations. God shows us from his word, if you do X, Y, Z, then I will change and stop and hold things back for you. So let's not give up tonight. Let's have faith tonight because there's a lot riding on us changing this nation. Number one, my kids having a life. And hopefully uh, the ones that are married, the grandkids, hopefully they'll come sometime. I'm dying to be a grandfather. But let me tell you something right now. We got to do it for them. We got to humble ourselves, Christian. No matter how old you are, we got to humble ourselves because it's important that we leave an inheritance, not just the financial one, but a spiritual one for our children and our children's children, according to the book of Proverbs. Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17, Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse number 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. Hey, listen to me tonight. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Because he didn't find it right here with his disciples. Not at this time. He didn't. So it's not uncommon for us to lose our faith or to be afraid or to give up when we don't succeed in our prayer life. But let me tell you something. Having faith means you keep doing it, believing it's going to happen. And I believe we can make a change tonight in America. I believe that. You know, I, I was thinking about all the names that pop through my head, like the Supreme Court justices who vote on abortion and think it's okay, like Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Darth Vader against her or whatever her name is. Wicked woman. Wicked. Wicked. Needs to be voted out, kicked out, thrown out for murder for murder. You shall say unto this mountain or this kingdom, 
Put it in the context of kingdom. If we want to change America, if we want to move a mountain, we want to change this kingdom, we got to be able to say to the mountain, remove hence to yonder place. Hey, you wicked culture in America tonight, get out. Get out of America. Get out of my nation. This is a Christian nation. The last time I checked, we were founded on the Ten Commandments. Last time I checked, we were founded on this book. Uh, the death penalty was founded out of this book for murderers and people who would abuse children and many others. But that's not my sermon tonight. The, America was founded on this Bible. So get out of here, wicked kingdom of the devil, antichrist-minded kingdom, spirit of Babylon kingdom. Get out of my country tonight. Go to yonder place. I'm going to pray you out of here. And it shall remove. Hey, but do you have faith to believe you can kick it out tonight? Do you believe you can kick this mountain out of here, this wicked evil mountain? Kick it out of my country. I'm sick of it. How many of our grandfathers and fathers would be so-called turning in their graves if they saw America tonight? How many of them would get up and gather arms and storm the Capitol building? Many from that earlier World War II generation that fought for our freedoms in World War I and, and the Revolutionary War, they are freaking out tonight because we've allowed them to turn a Christian nation into a wicked, pagan, idolatrous nation tonight. I'm sick of it. You know what Jesus said? It shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. <laughs> I'm not praying for a Lamborghini tonight. I'm praying that my country gets back to God tonight. I'm not worried about myself and what I got. God will give me the strength to make a living for my family. He's not going to give me everything I want, although he's given me a lot of things I want. He's going to give me what I need. And it's more important for my kids to grow up in a country where there's some morality. Verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What is Jesus saying? That this wicked, this wicked Antichrist spirit, this wicked spirit of Babylon, this wicked demonic demon spirit can only be kicked out of America if we have faith and we pray and we fast tonight. There's no other way. And it's going to take you working to do it. So we better get on our hard hats and our work gloves and our boots. And we better be ready to go out there and plow some fields because we need to get a hold of God. Because I'm tired of just sitting by and letting the, the, this, this wicked liberal agenda destroy my nation sick of it. And I'll tell you what, if you're in Africa tonight, if you're in the Philippines tonight, if you're in England tonight, you better kick them out of your country too, because there's a wicked spirit at the top of your nation as well. Why? Because it's a kingdom of men. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Verse 21, how be it this kind goeth out, but by prayer and fasting. I'm going to tell you right now, what is fasting? What is fasting? a verb and if anybody of you watched cartoons on Saturday mornings growing up and you saw the little uh, schoolhouse rocks a verb's an action word it's an action word and this definition of fasting is a verb means to abstain from all or some kinds of food or drink you know what it's hard for me to abstain from food I love food <laughs> some of the pleasures in life. One of them is food. I, I mean, it's hard for me, but I'll tell you what, even I've realized now that, you know what, I can read the Bible. I can know God's word. I can pray. I can pray hard. But if I really want to get a hold of God and fight a devil, I got to get a hold of the spiritual weapon of fasting. And we as a country tonight, as Americans tonight, we need to humble ourselves and fast. We do. There's multiple ways to fast. Don't give me this. I'm just going to fast and I'm not going to eat donuts for a week. That's not fasting. Sometimes you can fast from the time the sun's up till the time the sun goes down. 
But I'll tell you this, whenever you really need something answered from God or you need an answer, many times you fast. And have you ever noticed, though, that sometimes when you're at your lowest point, your hunger is taken away? Or sometimes when you have that loss of a loved one, the grief sets in and you lose your appetite anyway. And sometimes when you pray during those times, you realize that God's not that far away. Why don't we voluntarily hit that momentarily and just go into a state of grief for our nation? Go in a state of grief because our nation's dying and our families are dying. People are dying and they're going to hell. And America was a light for so many years. We sent out so many missionaries around the world and we still do. We are very generous. I, I, not, not everything America is doing right now is bad, but maybe my expectations are high. I wanted to do so much better because I see an underlining spirit, a devil that's crept in and I want it gone. I want to get back to some clean living. You know, the Bible, hey, people for years said, oh, you're being legalistic. Oh, everybody's trying to outdo everybody and see who can be the best Christian. Hey, the Bible says provoke each other unto good works. What's wrong with challenging other Christians to be more godly? You know what? If you're, if you're real godly, challenge me. I need it. I'm a sinner. I know who I am. I want to get better. I don't want to get worse. And guess what? I don't want to stay where I've been either. And we've gotten too complacent. We need to get rid of some things. I could get rid of some things in my life. I could get rid of some meals. I could go without some different drinks. I could drink just water or certain days cut out and just try to get a hold of God so he knows that I'm humbling myself because I love him and I want him to reign supreme in my life. Let's move this mountain together. Let's kick this, this wicked spirit out of our nation tonight. I'm going to give just a couple examples real quick in your Bible because I believe this is the last stand for America. I really do. I really do. As I watch the young generation grow up Christless, godless, without any integrity, turning your Bible to Daniel chapter number nine. When I, Daniel chapter nine, when I, and you're going to hold your place there too, so get a bookmark out, Daniel chapter number nine. When I see what's going on in our country and I see the direction it's taking, we have to do something. We can no longer idly sit by and let everything fall apart. We can't. And if every Christian just got a hold of God, we could remove the wicked mountain and we could get America back to being godly again. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahers, Asherhas, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, we were in Jeremiah, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. But verse number three, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications. When's the last time we set our face toward God and prayed and put our supplications and requests before him? With fasting and sackcloth and ashes. When's the last time we prayed, supplicated, fasted, humbled ourselves with sackcloth and ashes. We don't sit in sackcloth and ashes today. But when's the last time we got broken before God? That's how we'll save this nation. But we got to believe we can. 
We got to believe we can. Why? Because as a Christian, there's a kingdom inside you, the Holy Spirit. We can, we can dictate how this nation goes if we, God's people, stand back up again. So Daniel in verse number four then, he says, you know what? And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. The first thing he did was he said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Hey, Lord, I'm at fault. Lord, hey, get me out of the way as a person. Lord, hey, take care of my sin first. And said, oh, Lord, the great and dreadful God. Hey, nobody ever wants to hear about God being dreadful. Let me tell you something. If you really sit there and think about who God really is, he's dreadful. If you really take a minute, even in your mind, and you start to think that one day you're going to stand in front of the God of all the universe, it scares me. Scares me. Oh, well, Brother Aaron, you shouldn't be scared of God. Oh, I'm scared of his holiness. Right? Oh, I'm saved. I'm not afraid to go to hell, but I have respect for the Lord. And I'm afraid of how holy he really is and how powerful and great he is. Keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. You know, that sounds like something Jesus said. Hey, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, that's a theme throughout the entire Bible. But yet Christians today want to say, oh, that's just Jesus talking about if you love me, keep my commandments. No, see, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's always said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not for your salvation, but for your relationship. We have sinned, verse 5, and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. See, you know what the problem with Americans today? They've replaced their King James Bible with a television. They've replaced their King James Bible with a cell phone. Look, I'm not against you watching the sermon tonight on Facebook, but be careful what you replace your Bible reading with, because eventually that's what's going to be the kingdom resting in you. If you quench the Holy Spirit by what you're doing, then you're not going to have the kind of faith because your faith isn't being built up by this book. You're not going to have the kind of power to get a hold of God because the Holy Spirit is quiet and dormant in you and you're allowing your sin to separate you from God. Not, not your salvation, but listen, you can separate yourself from God while you're saved. The Bible says in 1 Peter uh, uh, chapter 4, uh, he's, it says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do wickedly. Peter was quoting Psalm 34 or 43. Hey, you know what, Christian? Hey, if you want your prayer answered, do what Daniel did. Confess your sin. Confess the sins of America. Get right with God. But that requires you humbling yourself and saying, Hey, like the publican, I'm a a sinner. Quit being a Pharisee. You're not right with God. None of us are. We need to get humble and get right. Oh, well, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I've been in church my whole life. Hey, the Bible doesn't say you're right with God because you've been in church your whole life. Because you know what? The Pharisees were in church their whole life and they were still wrong. What's in your heart? Is your heart in church? Is your heart in church? Verse number six, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in, in thy name to our kings, our princes and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. And, and I think about America tonight, and I think of how the writers of our Declaration of Independence and the writers of the Constitution and, and all the, the amendments and everything that these men spent time diligently doing to set up a nation like no other nation in the world. Hey, America is not a democracy. A democracy is when the mob rules. We need to kick these wicked democracy-minded people out of our nation. We are a constitutional republic. We have a checks and balance. 
balances. We have the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. We are not like any other nation in the world. America needs to stop playing the politics of forming democracies. If we want to do well, we'll start forming constitutional republics around the world. But you're believing a lie, and we need to kick those liars out of here. That's what we need to do. Why? Because America is a Christian nation. And we have certain rights uh, by our creator. And I'll probably butcher it because I'm all fired up. But hey, I, I, Joe Biden can't say it either. <clears throat> you know what? I could go on in this chapter here, but I want to get, I want to show you a few things because take what I've just said, what I've just read in these verses in Daniel and we're, hold, hold your place there. I may go back. I may not, but go to second Chronicles 7, 12. 2 Chronicles 7.12 in your Old Testament. 2 Chronicles 7.12. We're going to read verses uh, 12 through 15. And you'll notice some of these are, or at least one of them's usually quoted several times a year. Verse number 12, the Bible reads, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. Hey, you know, God listens to your prayer. If you're trying to do right, God's going to listen to you Amen. and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, what's God saying? Uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God for the Lord will judge his people. That's in Hebrews too. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hey, Daniel knew it was a great and dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So it's better to just get right now. If my people, which are called by my name, saved, shall humble themselves. Humility has a lot to do with getting your prayers answered. We can quote this verse all day long, but if we don't humble ourselves and realize who we are and what state we're in, and even the best of Christians is not that good. You'll see that in a minute. I'm going to read a verse on that one. And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Everybody wants to stop and omit that part and turn from their wicked ways. Hey, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his prayers are, or his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do wickedly. Hey, you know what? Turn from your wicked way and then his face isn't against you and his ears are open. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place, but nobody comes to church anymore. So how are you going to pray in the house of God anymore? How are you going to get together as a church on a Wednesday night and get a hold of God tonight when you're not even here? Now, right now, I understand why, but see, God will send a pestilence. I'm not saying this is from him exactly, but what I'm saying is, is if there is a pestilence, you need to pray that much more. Turn to first Kings chapter eight. <laughs> First Kings chapter number eight. Look, I want to take this nation back. Hey, there's some devils trying to get a hold of this nation. There's some wickedness getting a hold of this country. There's some demonic power that is in there, and there is no way to cast it out of here because Christians have tried for years, but they forgot their number one spiritual weapon, and that is fasting. It's a weapon. Why? Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Second, or I'm sorry, first Kings chapter eight, verse number 33. See if this sounds familiar to you. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned. Daniel said, Hey, you know what? Uh, uh, I'm reading in the book of Jeremiah, but there's some other things probably coming into my mind. So maybe uh, maybe I'll pray to get the sin right in my life. Well, Daniel, you're a pretty good guy. You did a lot of things right. But Daniel knew that if he said he had no sin, he was a liar and he deceived himself and the truth wasn't in him. Daniel knew he was a sinner and he said, look, I've sinned. 
And then he said, look, my people have sinned, right? Hey, listen, because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house. Then thou in heaven, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again into the land which thou gavest unto their father. Hey, look, I want us to take back America. I want the freedom in America. I don't want to lose another freedom in this nation. We've given up too many already. And bring them again into the land which thou gavest to their fathers. Boy, our forefathers are in my grandfather and his grandfather and my great great grandfather. I got to be turning in their grave tonight. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou afflictest them. Look, sometimes God has to get a hold of us in order to make us better. There's countless stories through the Bible where God just lets you do your own thing for a little bit. And he says, you know what? Just like any good parent, hey, son or daughter, you've gone a little too far. Now I got to bring you back. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive thy, the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. If there be in the land famine, hey, let me tell you something right now. I don't know if you're aware or not, but many of our meat packing plants, many of our produce places are struggling. Hey, guess what? There's going to be a famine. It doesn't always mean that the weather's going to be bad. It means there's going to be a famine. The word famine means shortage. We're going to probably face a food shortage here. Long. Hey, right now it's all good. Hey, right now everything's great. Hey, Christian, why don't we start fasting now before the shortage comes? Oh, I'm fasting. Why? Because there's no food at the Walmart. That's not the same kind of fasting. If there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be a cat, be caterpillar, if, if their enemy besieges it, I'm going to say this too. Now we got all these Asian hornets running around taking out all of our bees. Hey, guess what? You think God isn't just letting some things happen now? I mean, did you just all of a sudden wake up and realize maybe God's trying to get your attention? And now everybody's so scared. They're just turning on the news instead of turning on their King James Bible, instead of turning on some good old hard preaching, instead of turning on their prayer life. And they're just watching the news and they're freaking out. If their enemy besieged them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague... And I think this one would cover what we're dealing with. Whatsoever sickness there be. Hey, what's God saying? Really doesn't matter, Christian. Hey, Christian, it doesn't matter what's out there. It really doesn't matter. Why? Because when the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith on earth? The disciples couldn't do things because of their unbelief. Let it not be said of America and the Christians in America that God couldn't do anything in America because of our unbelief. <clears throat> what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart. You know what? We need to realize who we are and humble ourselves. Each one of us has a plague in our heart. Oh, but I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I've been in church for 32 years. You got a plague in your heart and you know it. Oh, I, I know all the hymns. I can name all 66 books in the Bible in order. I can quote 110 verses. You got a plague in your heart. I guarantee it. Why? Because you are in the flesh. You are a sinner. And spread forth his hands towards this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest. Listen, let's get our heart right tonight. Let's humble ourselves. What's that mean? Confess your sins to God. Amen. Ask him to forgive you. Amen. Confess everything. Pray, Lord, please. 
This isn't a this isn't a just sit down and, and hurry up. You only got 10 minutes till till your show starts tonight. Whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Hey, it's a fearful thing, right? It's a great and dreadful thing. Hey, I know that when I stand before God, the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. The last time I checked the word every means all and all means all and every means all. And let me tell you something right now, every knee will bow, including the same. And every tongue will confess. And I'll tell you right now, I know that Jesus has justified me, but I'm still scared. Why? Because he's God almighty, perfect, holy, and true. And I, like Peter said, am a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. You know, Jesus came to Peter on the boat and, and, and Jesus said, hey, cast down your net on this side of the boat. And Peter said, hey, Jesus, we haven't caught nothing all day. He says, just drop the net. And he drops the net and he pulls up a ton of fish and, and he looks at Jesus and he said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. That's the kind of heart we need to have. Lord, get away from me for I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, no, I'm now going to make you a fisher. I can use you because you're humble. I couldn't use you until you listened to me and humbled yourself. That they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Hey, listen, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the only way we're going to take them down is to get a hold of God. That's the only chance we got. America's done if we don't do it. The Philippines are done if they don't do it. Germany is over if they don't do it. Everyone is done and the devil will win if we don't take it all back. And it's up to the Christian and every nation to take their country back, their, their country. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your word. We thank you for everything you've given us. I thank you for this land. Oh, I thank you for the freedoms that we've had to worship you. Lord, I, I just thank you for just everything. Let it not be said that we're unthankful. Lord, all oh, Americans need to be thankful for the heritage that's been handed down, the freedom to read our Bible, the freedom to assemble in church, the freedom to talk and say the things that need to be said, the freedoms to stand up for what's right. Oh, but we're losing them. We're losing those freedoms every day. Every day, the devil's tightening the noose around our necks and we're, we're letting them, but we don't have to. We don't have to. Lord, help us. Lord, I know you can intervene, and I want you to. Lord, forgive me a sinner. Lord, please. Please. And Lord, heal this nation. Each one of us has to make a decision, and Lord, please help us to do so. Lord, help me to put my selfish will aside and what I want out of life. Help me to be an example to my family. Help me to be examples to those that I work for and work around. Help me to be an example to those at the church. Lord, I just ask that you help each one of us to realize what's at stake. Lord, help us as Berean Baptist Church gets ready to meet on Mother's Day. Help us to acknowledge the mothers. Oh, Lord, the mothers that have brought these children into the world and have loved them and, and oh, the love of a mother towards her kids. Lord, I've watched many, and you know this, many, many mothers weep over their children. Lord, I just ask that you help us. I, I don't even know what to ask other than help us, Lord. Please help us before we lose it all. In Jesus' name, amen.